he said, Mark, I've never seen it described this way, but it's so true. It's so true. We all, we all have to face the reality of face planting back down on net zero when we pay cash for things. Mark, I, I am interested in how to see how you deliver this topic because this is um, not by far, but we, we had the most registrants, registrants for this webinar. And I think it has a lot to do with your title of it and how we're picking on Dave Ramsey, which I love to do. Matter of fact, I got kicked out of his Facebook group because I did it so much, apparently. Um, really? It's one of my, one of my, well, I didn't get kicked out, but I can no longer comment. So I feel Ooh, like wow. there's a setting in there. And um, anyway, I guess he didn't like my point of view or the way I do it, probably the way I delivered it. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's always, that's, I do silly stuff for entertainment, but um, so I, does he. I am, yeah, so does yeah. Dave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think the title of it, uh, I got more messages, personal messages saying, Hey, I'm really interested in because of what you said about Ramsey. And so I'm, I'm curious to see how you present this because, um, we've been making some new moves, I, I guess you could say with our finances and doing some stuff, uh, some big purchases, if you will. And, uh, you know, I've talked a little bit about that. I probably need to catch up to speed on a couple of those things. Cause they've happened here. Quite- you got that private jet. Yeah. <laughs> was, I, was, I, was that was that public knowledge yet or uh, uh that that's that has not happened yet i don't even know the, if that's on the radar not the second private jet you just got the one so far okay got it all right yeah no no we went no it's uh it's good though i like it i like it thank you thank you for that uh awesome well um one thing i'd like to do just to get people involved in the chat and if you can hear my kids screaming in the background i apologize couple of them were not feeling well. It's near Don't apologize time. for bringing more helms into the world, man. That's, <laughs> we need more of you in the, in the world. Uh, so thank I you don't know that. about that. <laughs> uh, but if you guys in the chat, if you could let us know where you're from this morning. Uh, Sarah, you said you're from California. It is a good morning there. Wow, it's early, right? Uh, let us know where Austin, Texas. Chris, uh, glad to have you. Haiti got your hand raised i don't know what to do with that just all right yet. brandon hey brandon good to see brandon you sir. rush from connecticut south central missouri illinois orlando down in mickey town tulsa oklahoma rudy from vancouver washington home state is flow right out good deal brian rockwell texas wait a minute i saw something up here i travis Kat. say travis Hey, Kat. Kat, I know, uh, I know Kat, Brandon. There was one other name that, why is my mouse not working right now? Uh, Jason. There's J- two Jasons that I know of that are on here. Good to see y'all's familiar names. And uh, New Iberia, Louisiana. I don't know what Rolla Mo baby means, Travis. So if maybe if you can interpret <laughs> <laughs> that. <laughs> maybe Missouri. Rolla, All right, there Rolla. you go. Hey. Rolla, that's that's the Alabama education coming in on how to pronounce stuff. There we go. Rolla, Missouri. Uh, Gulfport, Mississippi. Olivia, good to have you. Uh, I've been to Gulfport quite a few times. I actually used to have a a client back when I had the W-2 that I had to go visit frequently. So uh, there's a shrimp boat joke in there somewhere, but we'll leave that be. Um, (laughs) Probably y'all have casinos over there too, right? If I'm thinking correctly. That's Biloxi. I know Biloxi does. Anyway. Jason Rabbits. Mark, how would you like to kick this off, sir? Yeah, we can have some fun. We're going to let uh, you pop in at any point, Jay, to interrupt with a question that you have or that our, our awesome team here, or participants here have. Uh, this, is, this is something that is insanely like personal to me because as I'll share in a minute my story, debt is not um, going away anytime soon on a national level but also on a family level. And in my own life, I started out my own financial journey way below net zero. And I'll talk some about that. And I might even try to draw some of that um, if you guys, uh, if we have time for it. So we got till the top of the hour, right? So I'm, and I'm going to leave plenty of time for discussion in between. So don't wait for your questions at the end, put them right into the chat as you have them. Now, if you're like me, you can walk into the pantry and forget why you walked in there. 
Uh, and so if, if you let too much time slip by, you might forget your question. So go ahead and write it down. <laughs> I, I was just having this conversation with my wife yesterday. I was like, you know what? The kids were asking me to do stuff. I was like, I've got three things I need to do real quick. It's like, I'm not going to write them down because no, no, no. I, I was going to Lowe's. I need, I need to get three things at Lowe's. I'm not, not going to write them down because I'm going to do these things for the kids real quick. And then I'll put them on my list. Right. Yeah, sure. 10 minutes goes by and I forgot what in the heck I was thinking. <laughs> it's, it's, it happens, yep. right? I hear it gets worse with age. So, yep. um, anyway, I'm not even sure. Right. I'm not even sure, you know, um, what we're here for. So let's get right to it before <laughs> I forget. Let's forget. Let's, let's not forget. I'm ready to jump let's in not. if you are. All right. I am one, one more disclaimer. So it, I'm going to stay on camera. I got some feedback that, uh, me popping in on, cause this, we've done this a few times and, uh, me popping in on camera can be distracting. So I'm going to stay on camera as much as possible. But if the kids run in here or whatnot, I go off camera for a minute. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to warn you guys. This is what my profile pick is for zoom. Now it is not the most professional thing like Julia has on hers for leg growth and, and Mark's company, but this is, this is what it is right now. Okay. This is a Dunder <laughs> Mifflin, uh, with when the beard was really grown out. So if you see that pop up, that's what that is. Don't get caught off guard. It's, it's my, <laughs> it's a, it's an inside joke. Anyway, love it. Uh, all right, Mark, take it away, my friend. Guys, if you have okay. questions, please ask, because chances are you're not the only one that has that question. And uh, there was one other thing I wanted to get to, but like we were talking about, my memory slipped me. So let's get into it, man. Let's let's sure. let's talk. Cool. All right. So uh, I'll start with my personal journey here. Um, there's a there's a start to our journey. And I'm going to start it way back when I was five years old. I, I had about 50 bucks that I had collected from allowance and lemonade stands. And I had put that money in a paper bag. And I had that paper bag in my uh, sock drawer. And that's where I kept all my cash. And uh, somewhere around year five or six years old or so, my mom walks in and says, I've got enough money now. $50 was the minimum needed to open up a checking account at the local bank. And so being a good parent, she she's taking me now to the bank. Uh, and my job there is to hand over my precious paper bag of all my money to this stranger so that he can tell me that I now have a big fancy uh, bank account at the bank. And, you know, I had significant like reservations about this whole operation was my mom and this banker guy, were they in collusion with each other to steal all my hard earned lemonade cash? Uh, little did I know how close to the truth I was as a skeptical little five-year-old <laughs> about how banks work. Uh, so, you know, they start you early on the addiction to banking, I guess, but uh, fast forward a few more years. And now I've, I've, I'm in a dirty hotel room. I'm 18 years old with a strange woman and her name is Sally May. And I'm signing literally in a hotel room, signing the loan documents uh, for all of my student debt I'm about to accumulate and seven years in the desert in Abilene, Texas, go wildcats. Um, I, I accumulated between my wife and I, mostly on my ledger, $120,000 of student loan debt uh, and graduate, we graduate together in 2008. So 120 grand is a lot of money, but it was even more back in the day. I, I looked at inflation and that would be close to about a quarter million dollars of student loan debt in today's dollars. Uh, so that, that floored me as I look back at that, uh, but I had no idea at, in the moment at an eight, as 18 year old self, what I was doing. And maybe you guys can relate when you take that credit card, when you take that car loan, when you take that mortgage uh, or, or whatnot, or that student loan debt, like I had uh, a quarter million dollars of today's money or 120 grand in those days uh, was, was just like, you know, sign it, sign it. And let's move on to, you know, the lazy river and the beer pong and whatever else is going to happen at, on my college days. So uh, we, we made it through college. We graduate in 2008. Um, you know, you guys probably uh, maybe you remember, was that a good time to be looking for work? Um, was that a good time to be searching for, and we didn't exactly have like marketable degrees. Uh, so, uh, Jay, what were you doing you, in 2008? I, I was, I was working still at this startup that I was a part of. And, um, I was just now dipping my toe into real estate investing in, uh, 2006 or 2007 and, uh, bought my first, investment property, which I now know can look back and say that was a huge false start to this whole thing. So yeah, 2008, mm -hmm. it's a, you, you know, it's interesting and, and uh, don't let me go too far down this rabbit hole, but um, it's amazing that the government and lending institutions will loan an 18 year old 
$250,000 as you adjusted to today's inflation for a degree for a piece of paper, but would not allow them to do that with anything else. Rent a car. Right? Like, yeah. rent, I mean, buy a car, <laughs> buy, buy an investment property or yeah. do any sort of investing with it. Start a business. Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah. Seems well, like there is a underlying hand at work there. But anyway, we're not going to go down the yeah. rabbit hole. Yeah. Hey, I did, I did look <laughs> and found out that the the debt of student, student loan debt is actually the number one largest asset on the government's balance sheet. What does that tell you in the land of the free wow. that we are the government's greatest asset? You know, yeah. so I'll just leave it at that. So what if you are on this webinar today and you are one of the rare few that are debt-free? Should you just check out? Is this not a webinar for you? I'm going to say no. This is going to be important for you, even if you are one that chases um, paying cash for everything. I just got off the phone with somebody in Texas today, uh, and this is his story. He's overpaying on his mortgage. He's got all of his other debts paid. He's about to be mortgage debt-free. Is he doing it right by just paying cash for everything? And I had another person ask me just yesterday, Mark, I've, I've got all this debt and I, I know I'm not getting any younger. Should I save or should I pay off my debt? That was their question. Maybe it's your question today too. So that's those three pieces. What's the best sane way to manage the problem of our, of our past, the debt? What about paying cash for things? Is that really the answer? And then third, should I save or should I pay off debts first? Those are kind of our three key kind of, we're going to play with those questions some today. So let me go ahead and. Mark, you muted I, yourself. I just hit, you, I just hit muted. You yeah, sorry about that. There we go. <laughs> so guys, this is going to be, I think, a sane and refreshing approach to paying off debt and building wealth at the same time. Now, uh, as we, as we go through this, uh, I just want to say I am a, um, I'm, I'm a certified financial planner, uh, but I would suggest I'm not your average financial planner uh, uh, because I'm going to be bringing up some concepts that your, your retail investment guy down the street or gal down the street probably won't share with you and may not even know about. Um, and I've had the privilege of working with clients all across the country to talk about some of this. So uh, what, what is the, first of all, Jay, Jay, what is the best way folks can, can connect with us and what is the best landing page for them to go to? Yeah. So after this, we're going to, at the end, we're going to put up a link and I'll put it in the chat uh, here in a minute, but it's w2capitalist.com forward slash bank, B-A-N-K, w2capitalist.com forward slash bank. Actually, I just need to change that to w2capitalist.com forward slash mark. That's what I need to do. Hey, but for right now, right. it's just bank. So Sure. All right. <laughs> Well, we can um, we can have that conversation at the end, but I uh, just want to make mention, guys, if you've got um, if you've got any questions about what we're going to be doing, go to that site because that's really that's really where we're going to have our um, our, our answers for you. So, uh, okay, so as we get into this, I want to start with putting a picture in your mind of a of a of an airplane, and as you guys think about that airplane, I want you to think about getting up in the air and flying that little airplane. Now I've got a, a fun story about flying airplanes. Uh, it was really the, the beginning of oh, 2018, 2017, my buddy was getting his pilot's license. And as he and I were getting up in the air, he, he needed someone to help fly to like share the cost of fuel. And so what we did was he shared actually his, his uh, fuel cost with me and I got to fly up in the air with him on this little prop plane. And we went from way out in the sticks, Chicagoland, all the way to downtown big buildings over Lake Michigan in about 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, and we got to fly around. He handed me the controls. I was flying the airplane, you know, over Lake Michigan. It was so, it was like a dream come true. It was like, um, it was like flight simulator 1995 all over again, except even cooler. So um, I say all that to tell you that he taught me about the environment and he, he described an airplane flying through an environment. No airplane, unless you're Elon Musk, flies in a vacuum. It's always flying through uh, uh, an environment. There's always a headwind. There's always side winds. Uh, and so this little airplane uh, that we were flying that day could go about 100 miles an hour in nil wind. That means if no wind, it could, it could pump, pump, uh, pump out enough energy to push us about 100 miles an hour. Small little prop plane. And so we... we did our flight and landed and it was all great. Now I want you to imagine your airplane in your mind, but this airplane, your environment, you just so happen to take off and your airplane is now flying into a headwind 
coming at you at 350 miles an hour. Okay, so we've got a major hurricane force winds up in the stratosphere, whatever, and that's coming at you at 350 miles an hour. Jay, your airplane can do 100 miles an hour in one direction. The wind is coming at you at 350 miles an hour. Um, no matter how hard you push, which direction are you going? Are you going forward or backward? I'm going to go backwards. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Didn't, didn't, uh, no hard questions today, I promise. <laughs> yeah. No, no. I'm just sitting here with, with a hurricane of 350 miles per hour. I know you're not a Florida guy or you probably never dealt yeah. with hurricanes. They don't get that high, man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. I'm showing an extreme example because yeah, I like the, it. The, the average debt in our average American is spending 35% of his or her income on just servicing debt. That's according to the U.S. Commerce Bureau. Now, so why do I say 350 miles an hour? Well, if you're spending 35% of your money to service debt, that means you're living on 135% of your money all the time. Meaning even if your airplane is going 100 miles an hour, you've got headwinds coming at you faster than you can pay off the debt. If you're just servicing the debt, according to the U.S. Commerce Bureau. And, you know, guys, that's, that's a big chunk of money just to service that debt. And so you're right. We've got worse than a hurricane pointed right at us. Uh, and we don't understand how that works. We don't understand the environment where our money lives. But here's some good news. It's, it's not about headwinds permanently. If you can land your plane, you can wait for that hurricane to blow over, right? And then you can wait for nil wind, which is like when there's no headwinds coming right at you. And everyone thinks that that's as good as it gets. That, you know, hey, if I just pay cash for everything, I no longer have to service a banker to borrow his money or her money. I'm paying cash for everything. I'm winning the game. That's, most people think that that's as good as it gets. And I meet people like this all the time that, that you know, they think that really just paying cash uh, or flying your airplane at 100 miles an hour, going from Florida to Chicago for some great deep dish pizza, uh, that's as good as it's going to get. I'm here to say, no, there's something better than just paying cash. I think the worst thing we can have in our financial life is what's called the arrival syndrome to think that we've made it, that we've got as good as it gets, that we know everything, we have all the right answers. That's, that's like the, the worst disease, the worst virus in the human population today is, is not what you're hearing on the headlines. The worst virus in, in our human population is the arrival virus, the arrival virus. Uh, so... <laughs> I'd say the, the, the best thing we can do is not a nil wind airplane, it's a tailwind. That's what beats paying cash. So my, my conversation with you guys today is gonna essentially revolve around this. The idea of moving from a headwind when the banks are taking money out of your pocket, they're pushing interest on top of you, interest upon interest upon interest on top of you. We're gonna move out of that scenario. We're gonna move into paying cash for things and we're gonna move better than just paying cash. We're gonna uh, move into a tailwind where you've got 345 miles pushing behind you. Plus that little airplane is cooking at hundred miles an hour. Jay, could you have deep dish pizza by lunchtime with that kind of a uh, tailwind? I think you could, no matter where you were in the continental U.S. Yeah. 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 <laughs> awesome. So that's kind of the big picture I'm going to talk to you guys about today. So, uh, and I want to, I want to take one second to just visualize this uh, for a second. So give me a second. I'm going to pull up my, my whiteboard here. All right, there we go. So this is what I mean when I say this, and, and this matters for the rest of our conversation. So there we go. So I want you guys to just sort of picture with me. Can you see this whiteboard on the screen there, Jay? Yes. Gotcha. Is it coming up? Okay, cool. Thank you. All right. So we've got a positive net worth up here. We've got a negative net worth down here. And this is sort of time. You could kind of see this as like, you know, your life over your lifetime. So this would be zero net worth right on the line, okay? And I want you guys to think about when you graduated college or whenever you got started in life, let's just imagine that you had very little or nothing to show for your money. You'd be like right here, okay, right on the line. And now- Talking about need... me personally, Mark, yeah. <laughs> you're gonna need a negative uh, yeah, arrow. Yeah, negative, yeah. <laughs> very yeah, most, far that way. <laughs> most high schoolers are a higher net worth than most college grads, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so let's say that you needed to buy a car right away, like this afternoon, but you had nothing to show for your money. You had no net worth. How do you get that car in your pocket this afternoon? You'd have to go in and get a car loan, right? 
and now you're below net zero. And what do you think is going to happen next? 30 days later, Jay, what are they going to send you in the mail from the financing company that offered you that big loan for that nice new Mercedes that you're driving around? They're going to give you <laughs> it's what? It's not a Mercedes. It's a used Ford. Okay. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> the ultimate driving machine. So that's 30 it. days later, you're, you're, you're below net zero. And now 30 days later, they're going to start asking for some of that money back. And you're going to start climbing and crawling and scratching your way back up to net zero right here. And five years later, you finally get to call Dave Ramsey, don't you? This is your moment. You can finally scream, I'm debt free. But are you really? No, because that car is now five, six years older. The kids are kicking the back seat and it's starting to smell like old French fries. And that car isn't so cool anymore. So what do you do? You go back into debt. You get another car or you go get your master's degree or you get that second mortgage or you get that second real estate property. And you just keep living on this staircase of debt your entire life. Most people live their entire life running this, this rat race here. And what's going on here is money's falling out of your pockets, going to where? The bank. And they're making profits off your entire life. They're literally a partner with you on your entire life. It's, if, if you're spending even half of what the average American spends on debt, that's a good chunk of you know, a quarter of your day just as a slave to the, to the bank down the street. So what about saving and paying cash? Most people say they can beat the banks at their own game by delaying gratification and saving, saving, saving in a savings account. And once you build up a certain amount of wealth in your, your savings account, it's time now to go buy your car, right? It's 30 grand, 50 grand, whatever your car is going to be. Uh, and what do you do? You take a withdrawal, right? You leave the bank account with that money and you walk into the car dealer and you pay cash for that car. Okay, so here's my question. This is really important. How much interest are you now earning on the money that you spent? I'll put it, I'll circle it. <laughs> How much interest, put it in the chat. How much interest do you earn on money that you spent yesterday? You know, sometimes these questions are so simple. I'm like, no, he's trying to trick us. Yeah. <laughs> No, no, uh, no trick, uh, no tricks on this one. Nada, Brandon writes. Yeah, exactly. So true. And what happens next is really even worse. You start growing your interest again slowly. You've broken compound growth and you only start earning interest again slowly as you put money back into the savings account again, only to let it fall again on the next car that you buy. So the truth, guys, is you finance everything you buy. You finance everything you buy. Because either you pay interest to a banker or you pass up interest you could have earned on that money had you not bought the car and just left the money invest instead. I did the math on this. And if you just save 350 bucks a month for your cars in a savings account, earning like 4% interest over your lifetime, if you're 35 years old today and you live till 90 and you just saved for cars, you'd, you'd have about eight or nine, 10 cars over your lifetime. Okay. And what would they be? They'd be old, junky, rusted out cars at the end of your life. So there you go. What if you'd put that money earning some interest for you, continually compounding that money? You'd have 900,000 bucks at the end of your life. Hope you like the cars. You know, that's, that's just paying cash for things. The truth is you finance everything you buy. In fact, I'm, I'm now committed to saying this, and you guys tell me if I'm way off the mark here, but um, I would rather be an honest borrower at somebody else's bank, then steal from my future self by paying cash for things. Now, what do you think about that, Jay? Is that, is that too fine a point? Well, no, I, you know, one of the things, every time I talk to you, you come up with these lines that I'm just like, I wish I need to hear it again. And it just ingrained and stuff. And I, I was waiting. I was like, when, when's he going to drop the first line that just <laughs> is so profound that resonates and kind of slaps me in the face. And that was it. That was it. I would love for you to repeat it. I was going to try to echo it but I'm going to mess it up. So sure, sure. Yeah. Here's my, here's my line. I've been thinking about this one. Uh, I would rather be an honest borrower at somebody else's bank than steal from myself, my future self by paying cash for things. Because the truth is I'm using my own future self. I'm stealing from my future self. That's 900 grand. I'm not going to have because I decided to, to buy my car today. So, you know, the, the problem is we all still got to buy stuff. Like what's the option here, Mark? Let us out of this, you know, this, this uh, conundrum. 
uh, I'd say that the only way I've been able to find that beats this kind of rat race, I mean, don't these look sort of similar? The debt staircase and the saver staircase are kind of trapped on the horizon line of net zero. We have to escape zero. We have to find that escape velocity and break away from net zero. Compound growth. You know, Charlie Munger says the first rule in finance is to never break compounding growth. Uh, Rudy says, get some rentals, have your tenants buy the car. Now we're talking. I was just going to say ride shotgun, but I like his idea better. So uh, what's, what else can you do? What if, <laughs> what if you could somehow use an asset that continuously compounded and borrow against that asset, but it continuously grew even while you were accessing that money? That's the question I want to ask you guys today. And wouldn't that be better than just paying your debts off or even paying cash for things? Okay, so back to the debt snowbank method. Any feedback, comment on that before we jump into what's next here? I, I want to make sure, because I think you're about to get in the what I consider the magic. This is the part where the part you just, the upside down staircase on the upward arrow, how your money grows when it's not technically in your account, so to speak, is the magic. And it took me a long time to, to figure this out, right? Or, or accept that this actually happens. Right. And actually, you're the guy that kind of made this light bulb go off. So it, I want to make sure everybody, if you're paying attention, if you're halfway paying attention, Mark, if you're getting into this now, this is the time where you really need to zero in on what Mark is about to say, because this is this is where the magic happens. Pardon the phrase. I, I just got off the phone with someone um, earlier this morning, uh, and this person has been a math teacher for 20 years. He's an engineer. Uh, he knows numbers. And when I showed him this this uh, graph, this chart uh, on, on, a, uh, on, on, a, on a screen share like this, he said, Mark, I've never seen it described this way, but it's so true. It's so true. We all, we all have to face the reality of face planting back down on net zero when we pay cash for things. He said, Mark, I've never seen it described this way, but it's so true. Or always crawling and scratching our way back up to net zero just to fall back down the debt staircase again. So we have to find a way to escape uh, net zero if we want any kind of change in our life. Okay, so let me share screen again here. Thank you guys. And we're gonna hit that. Okay, there we go. Hey, magic. So, okay, Mark, what if you guys- Mark, can I pause could... you real quick? Yeah, Just sure. for a second. So Siri, uh, Siri, can I call you Siri from now on? Sura. You said you're a little lost here. If you could just yeah. put in the chat uh, where particular you're lost, and we'll make sure that we get to it. Okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll come back around to this. So, because I get it. I totally get it. I researched this for, I think, four or five years and had multiple, not bank on yourself professionals like Mark is, but multiple guys who are in the industry try to explain it to me. But there's a reason why Mark's here today. So, let us know where you're lost or what's unclear, and uh, we'll try to circle back around. Or, We'll schedule some time with Mark and you guys can, can hash it out. Uh, yeah. Don't, don't let us uh, run over something if something's not clear. So um, I don't, I get, don't use your own money, do financing. Um, and if you want to come live too, maybe that would help, but um, feel free to just interrupt me again, Jay, if you guys want to go further here, but you're right. It is, it's counterintuitive to think about a, an asset that continuously grows on a J curve. Sorry, Jay, for the, the trademark violation there. Uh, but all my um, royalties, <laughs> uh, I want my money growing on a J curve, uh, but I want to still access that money, right? That's the problem uh, that we all face in finance. And if we can fix that, if we can find a solution to that, uh, then we win. You win by default because you beat the banks at their own game and you've avoided the problem of paying cash for things. So, what if you could do that? I mean, let's just hold, uh, hold that thought for just a moment. What if you could see that J curve happening? You could see your money growing at a faster and larger amount every year, no matter what. What if you could also keep money available for your family or for your business? And you had a plan for this year's business needs and the next year and the next year and the next year? What if you owned and controlled the outcome of your financial plan before you even started? I want to ask that one again, because that's a huge one. You think about your 401k, you think about your home value, you think about your IRA, you think about your, your real estate plans, anything in that list of financial vehicles I just said, 
that you actually control. I want to know, you know, is there much in the 401k that you have a guarantee on where you could actually own the number? You know, is that, is that even a possibility? So we're looking at now sort of, again, if we've got a choice between saving or paying off debt, my story was I was just throwing money at the debt. I was following Dave Ramsey's debt snowball method. And again, it was, it was a, a, a Herculean effort. My wife and I, we had rice and beans every night of the week. But on Fridays, we'd switch it up and had beans and rice. So it was, a, it was, a, it was basically just living on nothing uh, and trying to pay the banks. We were their slaves you know, for the vast majority of our 20s. Now, I now stop and think it was foolish to never even do the math there. Those were very important dollars. I don't know how old everybody is here on this call, but you're as young as you're ever going to be ever again. That much I'm sure of. Uh, so the, the money in your pocket today is worth more to you now than it will be next year, 10 years, 50 years from now. Rudy, you're 22 years young. Man, that's awesome. Your money is worth more in your pocket than the same amount of money in my pocket because you've got more years to let that money compound. Does that concept make sense? Oh, 20... Rudy says, just kidding. Well, hey, on this call, man, on this call, Rudy, anything's possible. So there you go. So again, guys, you want to do the math here and figure out, is this something that you're like, is your money doing what you want it to do for you? So I'm going to quickly describe the debt snowball method. This is a popular way to pay off debts. And this is what you might hear some radio hosts like Dave Ramsey talk about. And then we're going to talk some about, I think, a better method to paying off those debts. So here's how you do it. Real simple. Again, this is going to be popular uh, among many bloggers and, and radio hosts. The first thing to do in a debt snowball method of paying off all your debt is to list all of your debts, smallest to largest. So you put them all on a big list. And you can make the minimum payment then on all of your debts, except the smallest one. Some people say, hey, get the one with the highest interest rate and pay that one off first. Uh, but regardless, let's just say you throw everything you can on top of those minimum payments, you put as much as you can on your smallest balance debt and you wipe that one out. And then you attack the next account with that same extra payment and use that additional payment toward the next debt and, until it's all the way paid off. And by the way, this is sort of an afterthought, but you know, Dave Ramsey would say, hey, also, you want to just have nothing more than about a thousand bucks in your savings account for this entire process. So, Jay, you know, you've got a thousand bucks in your pocket. You might have tens of thousands or me, hundreds of thousands of student loan debt. You've got a thousand bucks in your savings account. What could possibly go wrong here? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> have you ever uh, had an emergency of, uh, <laughs> have you ever had an emergency of like a thousand bucks or more in your life? <laughs> yeah. Quite. Yeah. Yeah. Thousand bucks is laughable. Yeah. I don't know if that's, uh, that's if folks followed that plan, how many times might they fall back down the debt staircase, just trying to get out of debt? You know, it's like, uh, it's like crabs trying to get out of a bucket. They're going to pull each other back down. It's like, uh, it's like getting stuck in a, a mud hole. You know, you're going to slip back down the hole and, and stay stuck down there. So there's, there's a, a regular problem with just having a thousand bucks in your savings account while you're trying to pay off all this debt. Not to mention everything I just showed you guys on this slide here. You know, when you pay off your debts, you're basically five years older with nothing to show for your money. You know, so we've got to find a better way than just the snowball method. Uh, if there was something, what if there was something even better. What if you could be better than just debt free? You know, I'm showing this road here because, you know, I, I view our financial life like a marathon. And if you're paying off your debt, then essentially you're just chasing your way to get to the starting line. I have a buddy who's a marathon runner and he's, he's actually, let me get rid of this. He actually, um, he actually starts his marathon a good mile and a half before the starting line because there's so many people to go through the Chicago marathon, he's placed an extra mile and a half behind the starting line. Now, how many of us and raise your hand or chime in on the chat, how many of us started our financial life way back 
from the starting line. If $0 is the, is the starting line, how many of us, and I'm raising my hand, started way back, 120,000 yards in my, in my book, um, yeah, from the starting line of life. And you start running and you're already breaking a sweat and maybe even worn out by the time you even get to the starting line of your financial life. So let's get to it. What's the solution? What's a better way? What if there's a way to be better than just debt-free? Let me introduce to you guys something called the debt snowbank method. And this is a scenario where you literally uh, become your own source of financing. And rather than paying off your debt, you buy back your debt. Let me say that again. Rather than paying off your debt, you're buying it back from the banks. You're now owning the debt yourself, on yourself. You are your own source of financing. And in addition, you keep yourself liquid, meaning you have access to capital while you're still breaking free from all your creditors, all those snakes. So let me talk to you about this. Uh, so in, in essence, using the debt snowbank method, we're going to be using a newly modernized and efficiently designed dividend paying whole life insurance policy. We have to, it's a neat idea to be your own banker. That's a cool concept, cool thought, you know, theory, but we need it to be practical, super duper like actionable. And thank goodness there's a financial vehicle that's been around for over 200 years uh, I mean, this is not even their first pandemic for some of these insurance companies out there. Uh, so they know their stuff. And you guys, this tool can function for you like a bank. It helped me pay off all of my student loan debt and be better than debt-free. So let me explain these steps. It's fairly simple. Essentially, the first step in the debt snowbank method is to keep current on all of your debts. Pay your minimums on all your debts. Now, for those keen listeners, you guys will realize that's the same thing that I said about the snowball method. So there's no difference between the snowball and the snow bank in step one. We want you to keep current on your debt. We don't need Uncle Guido showing up at your door with the baseball bat, right? We want you guys keeping current on your debts. The next step is what's different. Step two of the debt snow bank method is to put anything extra that you don't need to live on, put that into a dividend paying whole life policy something specifically we call bank on yourself type whole life insurance. You, you put that policy in action and then you start accumulating money in that whole life policy. You start packing money in that policy. So I want you to imagine you've got a big pile of money. Let me get rid of this here for a second. You got a big pile of money. That is your debt. You got a small pile of money getting it started and that's your new bank on yourself designed whole life policy. Now, you're going to keep paying on your minimums and all your debts, so that pile is slowly coming down, but your whole life policy was designed not for commissions and death benefit like Dave Ramsey talks about, but it's designed to accumulate massive amounts of cash value very quickly, and you're flooding that policy with as much wealth as possible, so that pile of money is growing very quickly. So as you can see, at some point, your debt equals your cash value, and you can take a big pile of money out of your whole life policy through a loan and wipe out all of your debts. That's it. You're free. I had a guy who did exactly this, uh, and he, he actually invited me to his home to, to watch him burn his mortgage. So he paid off his entire house. If you want, if you want to do that, you can. Mark, Jay, you I want, to challenge, I want yeah. to challenge you on something real quick. Yeah. So, so you, you said you're free, right? Once you take the cash value of your whole life insurance policy and pay off your, let's say credit cards or mortgage or student debt, right? Any yep. of those three, all those three, you're, you're, you're not really free because you do have to pay back that loan, but you're free f the loan to yourself. So now your payments are going back to you while your original cash value balance and this, uh, I'm not yes. going to go there. Original cash value still grows, but you're free from those other creditors. Yes. Right. Who yeah. potentially foreclose on you and whatnot. And let's just say for, for an example, uh, I borrow from my cash value, right. And I have this incident that cost me more than a thousand, this emergency that cost me more than a thousand dollars, you know, to, right. to resolve. And I can't afford to pay that loan back to myself. Am I going to come foreclose on myself? Am I going to come and mess with my own credit score? You're going to send Uncle Guido to your house at dinner time? Yeah, no, probably yeah. not, man. Probably, probably not. not. Yeah. 
And this yeah, is, right, this is where I, I want to make sure everybody understands. Uh, if you have questions, please put them in the chat because this is the mind blowing. And I keep saying magic, but it's just the tool that's, like you said, it's been around for a couple hundred years. And, and uh, yeah. folks like us are just now really learning about it because yeah. of your efforts, right? And people like you who, who are, look, guys, there's a better way to do this. Break, you bet, you man. Know, don't be part of the system. So I, I, I would love to hear from, from folks in the, in the chat, what questions do you have as Mark gets back into it? Because we can circle back around to them. You guys have been uh, somewhat quiet for the, the crowd that we have here. Hopefully this is good, a, a good refresher uh, for you. But uh, Mark, take it away. You guys, if you have questions, please pop them in the chat. Yeah, please do. Um, and so you're right, Jay. You didn't, you, you wiped out all those snakes, those credit cards, those finance companies, they're gone. You have the deed to your house. You've got the title to your car. You've got the final payment notice from, uh, from your credit card company saying it's all paid in full. Your credit report shows a clean bill of health. The only debt you have is to yourself. You've bought back your debt, as I mentioned. So yes, exactly. I think that's that's a great distinction. But we're not uh, we're not the same as just um, as paying cash for something. And why is that? Well, once you've paid off the debt, as I mentioned in step three, you've wiped out your loans to credit cards or student loans. The step number four is another key piece to this puzzle. Why the heck are we running around with this whole life policy? Why didn't we just pay off the debt with cash? The distinction here is that a whole life insurance policy, if it's designed the bank on yourself way, has something called a non-direct recognition policy loan. And that loan allows us to continually access the money in the policy without liquidating the cash. And what I mean by that is, you can access this money. Meanwhile, the policy will continue to grow as if you hadn't touched a dime of the money. And the best way I can describe this is if you guys are familiar with how uh, mortgages work or a HELOC specifically, let me use a HELOC as an example here. Mortgages work great well too, as, as well. Let's and say just your for clarity, home is, Yeah, sure. HELOC, home yep. equity line of credit. You've Thank owned you. your house for about three years, right? And you've built up some equity, which is basically just cash that you haven't tapped into, right? That's it. So yeah. you go yeah. to the bank and say, hey, I want a home equity line of credit. They give you a line of credit, just very much like a credit card, but it's the collateral for it is your house, even That's though it. you already have a mortgage on it. So just mm -hmm. want to make sure we all are on the same page with that. And we have some great, great questions coming in the chat when you finish this little segment. Let's dive into some of those. Sure, yeah. Let, let me wrap up our five steps and then I want to go over the questions. And then if we have time, I can show some examples. So, um, okay, so with a HELOC, let's say your home is worth 300,000 bucks, just for example. And let's say you get a HELOC for 100 grand. So Jay, help me with these numbers here. Uh, home is worth 300,000. HELOC, home equity line of credit, they let you tap hundred grand. And let's say you take all 100,000 bucks out and you blow it in Vegas or whatever. Is your home just growing on what's left? Or is it still earning interest like you hadn't touched the money? Is Zillow, does Zillow care if you have a HELOC on your house or is it still growing? Still growing, right? Yep. So you've got a... Uh, <laughs> Uh, you've got a you've got a asset that continuously is compounding your home, even though you've accessed that money, the HELOC, and you've used the money. So the money is in two places at once when you have a HELOC. Now, what's why am I sharing this? Whole life insurance does the same thing, but with incredible guarantees that home equity lines of credit, 401k loans, and others don't have. Universal life policies don't have this option. The only way you can absolutely be sure that you're not going to go underwater on your home is to not have a mortgage or a HELOC on your home, right? Because you can go underwater with a HELOC and the banks can freeze that line of credit and they can take it away from us and they force you to pay interest to them every month on a HELOC. With a whole life insurance policy, it grows guaranteed every single year, no matter what. And that loan, the ability to access that money is guaranteed too. It's written right into the contract that you can access your money for any reason without question, it's your cash. Okay, uh, so imagine now we've paid off the credit cards or the student loans, but your policy is still growing even on the capital you borrow. 
So if you've got $100,000 of cash value, and let's say you paid off $30,000 of student loans, your policy is still growing on the full 100,000 bucks as if you hadn't taken a loan against the policy. And then just to wrap this up, once you've paid off your policy to yourself, the loan is now paid off, then the policy is made whole and you can do it again with the next account and the next account. So what you've done is you've paid off all your debts and you didn't have to just start at zero. You didn't just start at the, at the starting line of your life. You've had an ever-increasing compounding asset. You've been borrowing against your life insurance and letting that asset continue to grow and compound so that you're not just at zero dollars when this is all over. You're way up here and continuing to compound and grow your wealth. So that is the debt snow bank method. It builds more liquidity while you're paying off your debts. You know, you, you might have 10 grand, 20 grand of cash value. That'll certainly help you in an emergency while you're paying off your debt. It, it creates an additional stream of influx of, of inflow of money in retirement. And you're more liquid and you control the repayment when you pay off your debts. You actually are the one deciding how much you want to repay on that debt. Maybe you want to pay 200 bucks a month. Maybe you want to pay zero dollars for a few years. We had a gentleman, and I'll, I'll hush after this, had a gentleman who paid off a lot of debt. He had over a quarter million dollars of different kinds of debt. And he decided, his choice, it was all consumer debt. He said, you know, I want to flood my policy with as much wealth as possible. I don't want to repay my loans for a few years. I'm going to fund that policy, and I'm going to not repay my policy loan at all for another five years. And that's exactly what he's doing. He's in the middle of paying off all of his debts, pumping money into his policy, pulling loans out of his policy, smartly, of course, with a strategy to pay it off. And then when he's ready, he'll start repaying that loan after his, his debts are totally and completely gone. So to me, that beats paying debts the old-fashioned way or even paying cash. All right, I'm off my soapbox. Any feedback, questions, thoughts, questions at all on, on the debt snowbank method? I love it. We've got a lot of questions coming in. I'm just going to go down through these one by one and uh, fire them at you. Uh, Mark Davis asked, does the account earn interest? The account meaning the whole life insurance policy? Yes. In fact, it, it, it's, saving, it's savings on steroids. That's the best way I can describe it. Uh, it's not an overnight, get rich overnight plan. Jay, you know this. I know this. Right. Whole life insurance policies take some time to really build up. I say one of the downsides to the snow bank method is that there's some insurance costs to starting a whole life policy. Even an efficient whole life policy has some insurance expenses. So it might even take you more time to be debt-free. took me an extra nine months to pay off my debt just by doing the snow bank method. It took me nine more months to pay off that debt. Why did I do that? Because I have an extra $250,000 of additional wealth in my retirement because I paid off the debt this way versus paying off my debts, having no growth, no assets. And maybe to answer the question, guys, uh, it's, a, it's somewhere in the middle single digit returns, four, five, 6% tax-free returns on the whole life policy. And uh, I don't know if this applies for, for everybody, Mark, but I looked in uh, Mark Willis, uh, also Mark Davis. I, I'm looking to draw cash out of my policy. Uh, and I logged in yesterday and I saw it was 5.49 or 5.29% is what it was growing at. So uh, cool. I don't, I don't see that in, in my savings accounts. Um, anyway, Mark Davis has a follow-up question. Can you loan money out of the account to other people? Yeah, sure can. Now he's thinking like a banker. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can bank on yourself, but you could bank on other people too. Couldn't you? You can take that money out and invest in real estate. You can take that money out and buy an RV with it. Mm -hmm. ching, ching, uh, ching, ching. You can that's right. take that money out and adopt a kid. Mm -hmm. That's on your, if that's on your radar, a lot of different things. I mean, the way Mark, Mark Willis, the way you've explained it to me is that uh, it is your money. We may ask what you're going to do with it, but we really don't care. I, I'm asking out of curiosity only sometimes. Uh, some yeah. I, I get a loan request. I uh, had a loan request from someone today. He's up in Wisconsin from one of his policies. I don't know what he's using it for. You know, it's his <laughs> private. It's his private plan. You know, maybe we'll talk about it later if he wants to. But you are in control, not like a self-directed IRA, where there's a bunch of red tape and prohibited transactions. 
Certainly is. Matter of fact, when I filled out the certificate request form uh, or withdrawal form, there's not an option on there of like, what are you going to use this for? It's like, yeah, sure. How much money do you want? And where are we sending it? Yeah. That's pretty much, it, I mean, it was like great. a two page form, but it's <laughs> pretty much what they were asking. Keith, uh, Keith asks a great question. Do you mind if I, I no, skip him shoot. to the front here real quick? Yep. Keith says, if you can earn 10 to 15% in real estate, then uh, would this method not be useful? Now, that's a great question. Again, whole life insurance will do somewhere in the middle single digits. Let's just say 5% over time, over time. It's not an either or. When I'm thinking about whole life insurance, I see that as the parking space for my cash for everything else in my financial life. Debts was fun to pay that off. That was great. That was a lot of fun. But now my policies are earning interest at that nice, awesome pace uh, each and every year. Can't do anything about that return. It's going to keep coming at me even if markets fail and crash. But it's liquid accessible money, Keith. So if you're getting 10 to 15% in your real estate, congratulations. But if you could get more than that without any additional real estate risk, wouldn't it make sense to borrow from your policy, keep getting 5% in the policy, you'd pay a little interest for that loan, 1% or 2% maybe, and you put that toward your real estate. Didn't we just increase the market returns of your real estate with no additional real estate risk? That's pretty cool. So it's a, it's a nitroglycerin moment. It's a Mark yeah. Willis J. Helms moment. It's, you know, it's, it's <laughs> I would love Louise. to take credit for that, but man, it's, it's not me. <laughs> Keith, so I don't know, Keith, if you've ever dealt with hard money lenders, right? And you go borrow money at 10%, you're paying or maybe 15% to secure that real estate transaction. And then once you're done flipping that house or whatnot, you're going to go pay them off. Think of you being the hard money lender. You're borrowing from yourself at whatever the percentage is, 5.49 or zero, whatever it is. Right. And then, so it's compounding. It's, it's like you're, you're the banker, but you're also the investor. So you're winning on both sides. Uh, um, so great, great, great question. Uh, Jason ask, is there a minimum initial amount needed to open up one of these policies? Good question, Jason. Uh, short answer. There's always more. The, the shortest is it depends. But the slightly longer answer is <laughs> yeah, a couple hundred bucks a month probably is the minimum. The less you put in, the less you'll have. So if you put in 300 bucks a month into a policy, at the end of the year, you're going to have, you know, a couple, couple thousand bucks, 2,500 bucks, something like that in cash value. That's maybe that solves your problem. Um, maybe it doesn't. But start where you can. Don't let um, even that number dissuade you from at least having a conversation with us. Because I've had folks who said, Mark, I can't do any of this. I can't save two pennies at the end of the month. And by the time we had a conversation, we typically do a one, one half hour listening call where me or one of my advisors would chat with you. And we just listen, see if this is even the right fit. Maybe it's not even the right fit for you. But if it is, we find regularly, uh, like someone says, hey, Mark, I can't save anything. And then we'll ask them, hey, well, did you get a refund on your taxes last year? And they say, yeah, I got about $10,000. You know, I blew it on a flat screen TV. And we'll say, <laughs> first of all, can I come over and watch a movie? Because that sounds awesome. And then second, we'll say, well, let's maybe rethink that tax refund for next year. Maybe we put that some of that into a policy. So got it. Man, these are really great questions, guys. Y'all keep bringing them in. Uh, a few people have asked this in some form, some different form or fashion. Cody. Raul, uh, I think Rudy may have asked this. At what point in time, and it's, I'm summarizing, guys, so if I, if I don't get this exactly correct or your question is a little bit different, please let me know in the chat. Uh, at what point in time can you borrow from your policy once you start it? Is there a time limit or is there, you know, kind of walk through that a little bit? I'll tell a story. We had a, a, a very wonderful, very lovely couple. They are in uh, the Bay Area. And uh, they were doing a major renovation on their house. And he took a large lump sum from his savings. He had gotten an inheritance and had some earnings on a brokerage account and some other things. And they took a large chunk of money, put it into a policy as a lump sum. And within 30 days, they had borrowed most of that money out uh, to invest in and renovate their home. And so within 30 days is the short answer. But just imagine that's what they were able to do. Now they could have just spent that money. They could have taken that inheritance, 
dumped it into the drywall of their house and renovating their house and so forth. And then they would have had a, a house with a bunch of dead equity in it. But what they decided to do instead was put it into a policy first, borrow against that to pay for their renovations and the construction and so forth. Now, instead of one asset, their home, they have two assets, the home plus the policy. Hmm. So case in point, and then they're going to take their time to pay off that loan over a reasonable period of time. Brian asked, uh, or he was asking, can you, we, we talked about using the policy, cash value of the policy to invest in real estate, buying a business, uh, or paying off medical bills. And one of the things you and I have talked about uh, one-on-one is setting up a policy because all of us, or most of us, I should say, we have parents who are aging, who are going to need some sort of additional medical care or, or whatnot as they age. And where's the money going to come from that, right? And um, um, we've talked about how to use that policy just just for that. Again, guys, this is your money. You can use it how you want to, right? Yeah. Um, Rudy asked, uh, this method, method only applies to personal debt, right? Uh, as an investor, we're always going to be in debt. But no, it's not just personal debt. Right. Yeah, you, you certainly can use banks to your advantage, Rudy. Yeah, you know, I think most people here, if they're in real estate, can certainly certainly see the advantage of low interest mortgage debt on a rental property that's a positive cash flow situation. I'm not telling you to use a policy loan to wipe out, you know, low interest mortgage debt on rentals. That's, you know, follow Kiyosaki's plan there. Use debt to your advantage. What I'm saying is when it comes to using capital for for your consumer debt and or for big purchases, anything that's a major purchase, you know, your vacation, your rental property down payment, um, you know, your child's education, your your parents' long-term care needs, you know, the things that you were going to have to buy anyway with cash, this beats paying cash. You know, I used my policies for my down payment on rental properties and my personal home. So this, this is the kind of the alternative spot for your cash allocation. That's kind of the the way to think about this, in my opinion. Thoughts on that, Love Jay? It. No, I absolutely. Love it. Um, I recently paid cash for something and, and I shouldn't have. I, uh, I, now, latte. I now know that. Latte. Well, yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. no. Uh, it's good. It's good. Um, Brian Barrera asked uh, if you used to passively invest in multifamily, right? Um, in long-term investments, such as multifamily, do we have to make monthly payments? And uh, that's one of the questions I've had for you too, is we're taking out a loan from our cash value to buy an RV. And I'm like, mm -hmm. do I have to make monthly payments on that? And the answer is no. no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. it, Brian. You, you're, it's your money. You're the bank. You know, whether you default on a, a payment with a bank, they have to decide if they're going to come after you or not. A lot of people experience forbearance, you know, uh, through the last year and a half or probably maybe still experiencing it. In this case, with your policy, in your loan to yourself, you're the banker. So you get to decide, do you send Uncle Guido over to your house and right, bang on right. your knees or, or hit, your, hit up your credit score or anything? The answer is and, no, you're not going to do that. And so our anyway. I, I see our time is up here, so I'll keep this brief, Holy but you're, you're exactly right, Jay. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the piece here is if you never pay off a loan on a life insurance policy, they've already got your collateral. It's not like they're going to come repo your life, you know, Uncle Guido yeah. style. They simply deduct it from your death benefit if you pass away. So if I've got a million dollar death benefit and I die with a hundred thousand dollar loan, my family gets to keep whatever I bought for a hundred grand, that, that Tesla in the driveway or whatever, or the real estate, hopefully. They they take a million bucks minus any loan and they leave my family with nine hundred thousand dollars tax free. So that's the last day of the contract. They net it all out. Yeah. And uh, Scott mentioned there, no future taxes on your money. And wow, did we run through an hour uh, quickly. I don't, I don't know how much of your presentation you got through. I feel like maybe you've got was a more. lot more. Yeah, to go. There's, there's, as always, there's more, but uh, that's okay. That's all right. We, we, you want to leave them wanting more. And guys, sign up, um, w2capitalist.com forward slash bank. You get to hang out with the coolest people in the world in this community. I'm really honored. Uh, and, and it's been my commitment. I told Jay the other day, I've got a little ding on my calendar to come into the community, uh, the, the membership site that you guys have. Uh, so I can be a part of that. As long as Jay lets me in, he's got to, he got to unlock the, <laughs> the door for the nerds every so often to come in and hang out. But, uh, yeah, w2capitalist.com forward slash bank. And, 
one one other quick question that came in from Dennis. He was asking about are there age restrictions? You talked about that a little bit um, earlier. Can you can you just briefly touch on that? Yes, uh, yes, that is an um, important. You must have a birthday. <laughs> that's that's the only <laughs> that's age it. restriction. That's the only age restriction. Yeah, if you've, you, know, I've had folks up until age ninety. Age eighty five is easy to do. Even later, if if you have yeah. a good health, I had a guy who's eighty seven. And he was doing push-ups, 100 push, 100 push-ups a day at 80, 87 years old. He got approved wow. for a policy. I'm betting not too many people here are 87 years young, but yeah, as long as you've got a birthday, that could be a baby or an older person. Um, you can you can run with one of these policies. Now, devil's in the details. So yeah, let's chat. Yeah, yeah. And we're gonna get Julia on a uh, push-up routine. She's gonna yeah. get 100 push-ups daily. She can beat me on that. I don't know what she's saying. She's she actually <laughs> she crushes it. Crushes it. Uh, so. I know, oh. Jay, you, you and your 75 hard, man. Um, I, uh, I gotta yeah, keep up with both of you. It's, uh, <laughs> I've been taking a break from all that. So. <laughs> other well, guys, mind. the, the last hour has, has gone by extremely quickly. We covered a lot of stuff and if, if you're like me and this is the first time you're hearing about it, you feel like we're the first guy that presented this to me. I knew him. I knew him for a long time, upstanding guy in the community served at the church. And I'm like, he is trying, this is his opportunity to take me for my money. Like he's going to take my money and go to Vegas with it. And then later on, I'm going to figure out this isn't, that wasn't true. Right. So if this is your first time talking about it or hearing about this concept, or if you just have additional questions, I, the best thing is to sit down and talk with Mark. It'll be over. It might be over zoom or it is over zoom. Um, and you've got spots for 15 minutes, right? 15 yep. minutes, 30 minutes, whatever the case, whatever you have available, just to ask, pop in your questions and get in there because it took me, it took me. And I, I feel like I'm like the engineer, right? That you talked about earlier, new numbers, mm -hmm. but it was, it was until you presented the way you did, that it really makes sense. And, um, that was from the first time, uh, uh a whole life insurance representative who they are not all the same. I can tell you that for sure. Presented this idea to me until you presented it to me was a span of like four or five years. Right. And the first time you and I had was a conversation was on, on the W2 capitalist podcast. Mm -hmm. And I committed then, Hey, I'm signing up. We're talking. And that's where we are. Right. So uh, roll, now I'm year two funding the policy about to take out some cash value. And there was a question earlier and, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think this is depends and we'll wrap up with this, but there was a question earlier. How long do you have to fund before you No, that wasn't it. We answered that one. How long before, how many years, Razul asked this, how many years until the cash value is equal to the premium paid? Uh, and why not just pay off the debt instead of building up the cash value in a whole life policy? Uh, Two parts. Rewatch, rewatch this webinar is the short answer to that question. Um, yep. The, you know, what, what is the problem with paying cash? I'll just leave yeah. that question hang there. As far as when you break even, listen to our podcast. It's episode 91, 91 of Not Your Average Financial Podcast. Uh, sometimes it's a couple of years. It takes a few years for these things to break even, somewhere between three and seven and eight years, somewhere in that ballpark. So, you know, don't do this for a rate of return in the first few years, guys. It does cost some money to set these up, but it's a lifetime of increasing capital for the rest of your life. And when do you not need money? That's my, yeah. my question. Right? <laughs> and Julia put the link to the Not Your Average Financial Podcast oh, thanks, in Julia. the uh, chat. And that is episode 91 uh, is what she's saying. So guys, thank you for this. Because you registered, I'm going to send out the recording uh, as soon as it's available, probably within the week or so. But the best thing uh, for you to do is to get on Mark's schedule. And you can do that at w2capitalist.com forward slash bank. B-A-N-K. Mark, anything else for today? Uh, no. Uh, where do I get a done? What was it? Uh, that, that hat. I need to see it. I need to get a copy of that hat somehow uh, on my on my head. There you go. Cover this the right boldness. Here. There we go. There it is. Dunder Mifflin. Rock and roll. This this one was, uh, it was at a TJ Maxx or some store like that. And uh, here's how frugal I am. I love that show. I quote it almost daily. I didn't buy the hat because it was like 20 bucks. Yeah, I, I saw you took a picture in the store. Like it yeah, was exactly. yours. Yeah, I could tell. I could tell. That's, it. That's great. That's, it. That's great. That's all right. I got to return this shirt to the to the store after this. No, I'm just kidding. That's awesome. That's good stuff. All right. I better all right. run. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Julia. Everybody Thank have you, a great Mark. day.